concept of the conference. And again, let me let me emphasize that we're really, uh, Christian and I are so excited to have uh, all of you joining us uh, today uh, to start our symposium, uh, uh, International Symposium on Correlated Electrons. So welcome to everyone. Um, I'm also really excited to kick off the first uh, session here. So our theme of the first session is two electron reduced density matrices. And as Christian well put it, um, two of the really important ideas that emerge in our study of electronic systems are number one, the uh, pair interactions, which dominate uh, you know, electronic systems, and also the locality of uh, systems as well. So basically exploiting both of these um, can potentially provide tremendous advantages. And I think we'll see as a theme throughout the conference that many of the techniques being developed uh, you know, do exploit uh, these features in different ways. And so I think we'll see quite a bit of that in our first couple of talks of today's session too. I'm really excited to get right in. So let me uh, pivot here and introduce our first speaker. So I'm super excited to have Laura Gagliardi of the University of Chicago, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, to present the first to kick off the meeting with the first talk for today. Um, she's gonna tell you about some of the exciting research uh, in her lab that's looking at both of these aspects of both locality and essentially pair interactions. And so with really not much more ado, let me introduce Laura Gagliardi to start our first lecture of the symposium. Uh, Laura, whenever you're ready, um, let's uh, start the first lecture. Um, yeah, oops, let's see. Um, PowerPoint, so it's a little early here. We're just waiting uh, for Chicago as well. So we got our cups of coffee and trying to get ourselves awake as well. So I hope everybody's doing well, um, wherever you're joining us from at whatever time of day. Uh, uh, enter full screen. So, no, for some reason, it's not entering the full screen. I mean, do you see the full screen? It's still actually in the PowerPoint. I think you've, yeah. Um, yeah. it should be able that. to just go right to the slideshow. Let's see, let's try that again, yeah. Oh, okay, now oh, I've lost my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, okay, I can see my talk. So where is my talk? Okay, here is my talk, share. Uh, and if I go under full screen, um, presenter view, no, um, presenter view, no, no. I, no. No, I think, let's see. I'm having trouble seeing the, the tabs there, but there should be one that just says like, begin the presentation. Um, the first tab might be. Play from yeah, start? start? Yes. Yep. Uh, there we go. Yep. Great. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. So, that was great. Yep. Um, so first of all, uh, good uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank uh, um, the organizer, especially Christian and David, for uh, organizing, inviting me, and uh, giving me the honor to kick off this conference. So I'm uh, I'm super thrilled, and I'm super thrilled to be David's colleague at Chicago. It's really nice, and it's the beginning of a new era of collaboration. So that's probably why I'm opening this session. And actually, my talk will be more about local but then uh, towards the end, I will show you our initial collaboration with uh, David in which we uh, exploit uh, some of the concepts that he has developed on two RDMs uh, and combine them with our ways of treating electron correlations. But so the, the, overall, the overall arching theme is um, um, electronic structure with uh, methods based uh, on, uh, on active spaces for strongly correlated systems. And uh, I, I like to use this um, image uh, in my talks nowadays that show actually what, what has happened right now. Uh, chemistry, uh, physics, uh, science uh, really allows us uh, to work uh, all together in a global way, also now with uh, Zoom <laughs> in different time zones, but uh, breaking all possible barriers and in a very inclusive way. So um, my group in general is, um, is interested in, in studying uh, um, uh, systems with a, a strong Strong correlation, and uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, a dream to be at this conference. Uh, but we we like to study um, um, 
systems also, I mean, that are chemically um, extended. And here on the left, you see a material. This is a metal organic framework uh, where a reaction occurs. On the right, this is more of a molecular system, but uh, uh, with two transition metals that um, are strongly correlated. And so in general, when we want to study these systems, uh, we need to go beyond um, um, uh, the, the workhorse of quantum chemistry, which is Consham density functional theory. And uh, I mean, here there are in this audience experts in, in Consham, and uh, I, I don't want to, 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 to criticize it, but uh, um, I come from really the wave function uh, uh, angle to this problem. And so if we have these strongly correlated systems, we call them also multi-reference systems. So we, we need a multi-configuration wave function. However, the, the methods that are developed in, in conventional quantum chemistry for these systems are quite expensive and they can be used only for small kind of toy systems. So, so my goal is to develop uh, uh, new methodologies uh, uh, for extended strongly correlated systems so that uh, are based on these multi-reference wave functions and go beyond uh, uh, current consham uh, DFT. And so uh, I, I probably, I mean, this audience knows a lot about uh, the active space concept, but maybe there are some, some students in the audience, so allow me to recap briefly. So the idea here is that, you know, if you do a, a Consham or a Hartree-Fock calculation, and here you see that, so you have a, a, these molecular orbitals, uh, the occupied and unoccupied and a homolumo gap. If it's a, a periodic system, maybe you have a, a band gap. But the idea is that you have this well-defined homolumo gap. On the other hand, if you have these more um, complex systems with the transition metals, radicals, uh, it's, a, it's not such a clear cut. And so the idea is to define a set of orbitals and the electrons associated with them and allow these electrons to occupy these orbitals in all possible ways. And this is a complete active space uh, wave function. It's like a full CI within this active space. Um, and then um, to, to recover all electron correlation on top of this wave function, one for example, performs a, a perturbation theory calculation. And so, for example, the cast PT2 uh, to, to be quantitative. However, the problem, as we heard in the introduction, is that uh, here we are doing a full CI, so we have exponential uh, scaling. So um, over the course uh, of the years, uh, many groups, including mine, have worked on uh, methods to try to reduce, uh, break this exponential scaling. And so, for example, we have developed the generalized active space method. And the idea here is to, instead of putting everything in one box and treating everything together, to um, create these uh, sub boxes of orbitals and electrons based on some um, criteria defined by the user and also the excitations. So, so within the boxes or uh, among boxes. And in general, so um, the idea is that uh, one can include many orbitals, so can study chemically, physically, relevant systems, but at the same time uh, contain the, the, the scaling, break the exponential scaling. And this is, so the first part of my talk will be now on uh, some recent uh, ways of uh, uh, localizing the active space uh, on which we're working. And the second part will be on then what to do on top of this wave function or eventually on top of a two RDM uh, provided by David. So let's talk about uh, localization of active spaces. So um, we have been uh, working recently, this is uh, mainly a work performed by Matthew Hermes, uh, um, who's a senior um, scientist in my group, uh, on the idea of uh, localized active space uh, SCF. And so here the idea is uh, really to, to have an extended system divide uh, the active space into uh, subspaces based on, uh, on local fragmentations. And so here you see, for example, we, we want to have an active space on these uh, um, double bonds. Um, and uh, the, the last wave function is a product of the fragment uh, uh, cast wave functions and a single determinant that is a sort of uh, um, core that embraces uh, everything. And uh, um, this can be done also within the framework of density matrix embedding theory. So we can think that uh, 
um, this uh, single determinant is a, is a kind of bath that, uh, um, um, cover, let's say, embraces uh, all the, the localized active space. And so one can use uh, the, the same uh, Schmidt decomposition uh, of this last wave function as for a single determinant wave function. And then one can um, compute an energy by variationally optimizing the, the last wave function using this uh, density matrix embedding theory algorithm. And so um, the idea here is that really we have this, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the method scales linearly with the number of fragments. It scales exponentially only with the active space within each fragment. And there are, um, so there is this single determinant, this uh, uh, active space wave function. And so this wave function is more approximate than, for example, a generalized, because uh, it has this product form, but uh, it has no exponential uh, cost explosion with the number of subspaces. And uh, I'd like to say that we are not the only one working on this concept. There is this uh, active space decomposition method by uh, Parkin and Shozaki. There is a method by Gus Fuseria, CMF, and uh, a method by, around the, by uh, Kurashige. So I want to show you how does uh, this uh, last SCF uh, wave function work. Let's suppose that you are studying the system on the right and you want to um, fragment it, put a wave function on each uh, uh, double bond. Here the, the blue atoms are nitrogens and we, we want just to break this nitrogen, nitrogen bonds. So we start, we, we say we, we freeze the right impurity and we just uh, consider uh, the left impurity and we optimize the, the the, the cast wave function there. And then we freeze the left impurity and optimize the right impurity. And then we optimize all the uh, inactive yeah. orbitals, for example, those uh, uh, on the center bond. And we repeat this procedure until we reach a, a stationarity of the wave function. So um, as I said, uh, this uh, last SCF uses the same algorithm as the density matrix embedding theory. And so the idea is that if you have a, a super system, you identify a, a system of interest. In this case, we have all these fragments. And uh, one does a Schmidt decomposition of the wave function of the entire system so that uh, at the end of the day, one is to, to treat a, a just a second, maybe I want to just remove, yes, this is better. Um, so I don't, oops, uh, can you still, oops, no, sorry. I don't know why, what happened here. Let's try again. Stop sharing, play, okay, again. Okay, maybe, sorry, yes. Um, yes, we are here. So um, I just said that the cost basically of this problem is twice the cost of the, uh, impurity. And so what we are going to do now is compare some of the results with this last SCF methods with the density matrix embedding theory, where the high level of theory is this uh, CAS SCF. And here you see, this is a sort of a uh, sanity check because we have a, a molecule with only a double bond in the middle. This is also methane, and we are breaking this double bond. And so here we like uh, our method to agree with CAS SCF because we have only one fragment. And you can see here, okay, we, we see RHF, UHF, they, they fail to break this bond because this is an example of strong correlation. CAS SCF 4.4 is our reference here, this black curve. And then here in, in blue and uh, red, we have uh, um, um, several uh, uh, flavors of density matrix embedding theory, uh, one shot or uh, self-consistent, and they usually fail, especially at large dissociation uh, because um, I mean, the, the, I mean the, the idea of uh, projecting everything into this bath doesn't really uh, describe satisfactorily these strongly correlated systems. On the other hand, when we did our last SCF uh, with four in four, and here uh, we see that we obtain exactly the, the CAS SCF result, which is, I mean, as one would expect. So this just tells us that uh, the concept works. It doesn't say that it's a, it's, it's a good method. But then we looked 
at a system with two of these double bonds localized, and we are breaking them simultaneously. And in the middle, we have a, a non-correlating uh, uh, fragment with just a single bond. And again, here you see uh, the failure of RHF, UHF, and also these density matrix embedding uh, theory flavors, while um, uh, LAS SCF with two active spaces four in four uh, gives a, a result uh, in, in very good agreement with CAS SCF. And here the idea is that instead of having a cost uh, uh, related to the eight in eight active space, here you have two four in four active spaces. Another example where this approach works is that let's say that we have several metal centers in a in a system, and we want to study, for example, um, the spin uh, gaps. So here we have a di-iron compound, and we are looking at uh, the nonet singlet uh, gap. And so if one does a, a full cast SCF with the D orbitals on the two um, metals, one would have a, an active space of 12 electrons in 10 orbitals. On the other hand, we can uh, crank it down the problem into six in five active spaces, one on each uh, transition metal. And here you see, um, so here we have the with the full cast SCF, this is uh, the energy difference between the singlet and the nonet. They are basically degenerate. And these are the numbers of Slater determinants corresponding to these two cast SCF wave functions. So the singlet is about 44,000 Slater determinants. Now, if you, we use this partition, and of course, uh, last uh, in his initial formulation is not a spin eigenfunction. So we have to choose uh, the way in which to combine these two centers to, to, to form a, a, a singlet. And you see, this is the energy difference of the last SCF with respect to the cast SCF non-net. So basically these two states are degenerate as in the cast SCF treatment. And this is the number of Slater determinants. So you see there is a significant reduction. So when there are these centers, which, which have a relatively small interaction, the method uh, seems to work quite well. However, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, ideal in all situations. So when there is a, some interfragment entanglement, now, now we are going back to our two nitrogen, nitrogen double bonds to break, but in the middle, we have a, another double bond. And so basically the pi system is totally delocalized. And we see that, uh, so, ca so we have looked at two different active spaces, the 18, eight and 10 in 10. So 18, eight uh, is um, uh, the continuous line, 10 in 10 is the dotted line. And we see that last, I mean, does not really dissociate these systems correctly because uh, uh, LAS is a, a totally, I mean, it's a product of these states and there is no interfragment uh, correlation at all. So uh, the limitations of the method is A, that it's not uh, a spin eigenfunction uh, as we, we saw before. And so uh, we, we have different ways, for example, of reaching the uh, anti-caromagnetic uh, uh, singlet states and uh, one has to choose. And the other one is that uh, uh, it, it doesn't include these uh, uh, interfragment inter excitations. So how can we move forward? And uh, one way is to, so instead of doing a state specific class SCF in which we treat every electronic state uh, individually, we can do a state average like one does in CAS SCF, an average among different states, but also a state interaction. So if this is a, the, the energy expression for a state average um, um, calculation where you weight each state, then uh, one can diagonalize an Hamiltonian in the space of these state average states and get just state interaction loss as yet. And this is a, a direction in which we are proceeding. However, it has its own uh, limitation. So um, it's, uh, I mean, one has to define different state vectors by end, uh, it's a choice also, a large number of states, and then there are the size consistency and size extensivity um, issues. And also at some point, if you include a lot of states, you go back to the exponential scaling of the CAS SCF. 
So the question is, what about if instead of thinking about the state interaction, we think about a couple cluster or unitary uh, couple cluster? So this is our um, last um, wave function expression. Uh, and you can think about this uh, uh, product of this localized wave function, and then you have this uh, uh, determinant, single determinant that embraces everything. So. Can we uh, form, formulate our last wave function in, um, in couple cluster formulation? Uh, well, in principle we, we could, but uh, it's, it's quite complicated. So there is not an automatic way of choosing the configuration. Uh, it's not a variational approach. And uh, uh, we know that at least conventional couple cluster will hear a lot about um, a very uh, elegant ways to, to to treat multi-reference uh, systems in couple cluster, but uh, uh, in the um, conventional formulation, uh, it crashes uh, in strongly correlated uh, cases. So an alternative would be to use a unitary couple cluster where you have this anti-Hermitian uh, operator. And this is a variational method. Uh, it's a size consistent or size extensive. However, we know that it cannot be implemented efficiently on classical uh, computers. So um, let's see, why is this the case? I mean, if this is a, a UCC uh, ANSAT where we have this uh, uh, T operator, we have this, uh, um, we see the, 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 the expansion does not truncate. And so one ends up with an um, infinite uh, uh, body interaction. So we have these uh, infinite terms. And so in principle, one can uh, force it to truncate um, but only on um, very small, for very small systems, uh, uh, for, um, for toy systems using first quantization algorithm. An alternative is instead, uh, and this is something on which many groups uh, at this conference are talking and uh, will hear beautiful talks about it, uh, to implement a UCC uh, on a quantum computer. And UCC is basically uh, meant to be implemented uh, um, on a quantum computer because it can be implemented directly at the hardware the, uh, hardware level. And so uh, this is the workhorse of the variational quantum eigensolver approach. So what, uh, I mean, here, this is a, a summarizing uh, slide, uh, very basic, but the idea is uh, um, uh, related to the variational quantum eigensolver. And basically, so if this is our um, wave function <coughs> expression, the idea is that uh, the, the classical computer uh, provides to the quantum circuit some wave function parameters, and then the, the quantum computer computes the energy, and then there is this uh, uh, iterative procedure between the two um, architectures. So what we have decided to do is uh, to um, develop last SCF in a UCC uh, framework um, so that uh, um, eventually, I mean, it can be performed, this calculation can be performed on a quantum computer. And again, if uh, this is our wave function expression, so we have these products of active space wave functions and the, the single determinant, we can express our wave function um, with this uh, interpretation of these uh, exponentials of two operators where we have the orbital rotation and the, the, the CI um, coefficients. And um, you, one can think uh, instead of doing the all last uh, VQE um, um, at all level of excitation, we can truncate these uh, um, CI terms at double excitations. And so um, the idea is that instead of performing what is here on the left, we can perform the, what is on the right. So U orb is on the entire um, level of excitations while with this uh, uh, ULK are truncated uh, to double excitations. And so let's see what happens if we uh, perform this kind of calculations, which as I said, can be eventually implemented on a quantum computer. So here we are using two, we have a really, we are looking at a, at a model system. We have two hydrogen molecules. So it's a system with uh, four electrons, two on each of them and eight orbitals. 
and we are simply pulling apart these two hydrogen molecules. And um, one can think about it as a system where there is not a strong correlation between the two uh, hydrogen molecules unless they are very close. And uh, again, this is uh, um, our, our circuit. And uh, we can see, so here UCCSD would be as if we performed UCCSD on the entire system. But then we can see that the last um, fragment, the, the last approach and SEP would be as if we did a completely separated UCC. And, but we already see the last that is significantly reduced uh, in depth and number of parameters compared to the UCC SD. And how does it work? I mean, it works fine in the sense that this, uh, um, if we have CCSD is, uh, for this case, can be considered as our full CI result. Um, and then we have the LAS, um, and uh, this is on the classical computer, and LAS VQE basically uh, gives us the same result as uh, LAS. SEP VQE is, as I told you, it's completely separation and we see that uh, uh, the result is not in agreement with last. So we can say, okay, we can perform the last calculation on a quantum architecture. However, here last is still limited. I mean, uh, it does not reproduce the, the exact result. So the question is, can we do better than that? Can we use the quantum architecture to improve upon our last wave function? And so uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Matt Houghton, who now works at uh, HRL Laboratories and Stephen Gray at Argonne. And so the idea here is to envision a, a post last wave function where we operate on the last wave function with this uh, exponential of UG, where now uh, basically instead of using VQE, we use the, the quantum phase estimation. And here the idea is that uh, basically the, the, the wave function uh, is evaluated uh, with the quantum phase estimation in the quantum computer and then the parameters are sent to the classical computers and the, the classical computer computes these expectation values um, of the operator, in this case, the, the Hamiltonian, which are then passed to the quantum uh, circuit. And so let's see um, a, a little bit how this wave function uh, works. So um, the idea is to um, start from a classical last SCF calculation generate the last state on a quantum circuit by using QPE, and then apply the UCC as the uh, correlator. Um, and at the end of the day, one would have a method that is non-variational, but in principle, we, we go beyond just the last uh, uh, approximation. So we, uh, are not, we have now just implemented it on a quantum simulator, uh, but the, the first test was uh, can we try to test this on a, on a classical computer? And now we have the results also on the quantum simulator in agreement, but before doing that, we wanted to see if this uh, modified uh, last wave function was really uh, giving an improvement. And here we are lo looking at this system. We have two double bonds where the, there are these two arrows and we are breaking them simultaneously. And uh, um, we are reporting the, the, the potential energy curve. And so here you see, uh, so CAS SCF uh, um, 188 can be considered our reference. CAS CI 188 is, is also reasonably good. I mean, at a uh, long, uh, distance, the, the orbitals are not really optimized, and so uh, there is a little bit of a degradation of the result. But then you can see the last CF that we I presented before, it's, it's really not satisfactory at large separation. On the other hand, if we do this modified last with the UCCSD, uh, we have computed only two points, but we see that uh, the molecule is, is dissociated correctly. And moreover, uh, there is a mi minimal spin cont contamination, both at equilibrium and uh, at dissociation. So the, 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 the results seem uh, uh, promising in terms of binding energy. Also, why does the uh, last UCCSD work? Because we see, if you look at the 
the um, orbitals for, for cas SCF, basically, you see, you have these uh, uh, two uh, doubly occupied orbitals and two, two virtual uh, orbitals. This is when you break the pi bond. On the other hand, if you just do a basic last SCF, uh, you see everything is, has become kind of radical, which is different compared to cast SCF. Um, if uh, instead one does this last UCC SD, we see that uh, we, we restore this uh, um, occupation numbers more close to the cast SCF wave function. So the last UCC SD wave function um, recovers this. So the, the point to make is that with last UCCSD, we, we, we get uh, results of CAS-SCF quality at a significantly reduced uh, cost. And uh, at the same time, we, we exploit, we can exploit the quantum architecture. And it's uh, cheaper to do a last UCCSD calculation than a full UCCSD on the whole uh, system. So to, to summarize this part, LAS SCF is a good starting point for efficient multi-reference calculations of large systems, but it has some limitations. So uh, it fails when you have strong entanglement among the fragments and it's not clear how to make it more efficient. Um, on the other hand, unitary couple cluster is a powerful powerful uh, formalism um, also to improve uh, upon the last CF wave function, but uh, it's not a practical method on, quant on classical computers. And it is the workhorse of uh, VQE on a quantum computers, but if you just use uh, UCC for everything, it's very expensive. So by combining a last CF wave function, with UCC, we, we solve both the problems. So we improve upon last SCF, but we still have a method that is uh, more affordable on a quantum uh, computer. So we, we qualitatively fix the wave function and we reduce the, the computational cost of the full UCC uh, calculation. So this is the part on wave functions in general. So how can we get this uh, uh, good starting point, this good starting uh, uh, strongly correlated wave function? However, there is a step next. I mean, it's not enough, even if you have a, a unless you have the full CI, but if you have last wave function or cast, one has to do something with that. So historically, as I told you in this uh, um, framework, people do perturbation theory on top of these wave functions. And doing a PT2, I mean, it gives good results in many cases, but PT2 has its own limitations. It has some degree of empiricism, at least in the multi-reference world. And uh, when it works, it works. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And uh, there is not much one can do. So what we have been working um, um, extensively in the last few years is try to use a multi-reference wave function as a starting point for a subsequent uh, uh, density functional calculation in which we, we recover all correlation energy in one step. So it's not that we add something to the, the CAS energy, we just do a, we just use the CAS wave function. And in particular, in collaboration with my colleague, Don Truller at the University of Minnesota, we have developed a method called multi-configuration pair density functional theory. And the idea here is that we start from a MCSCF wave function and evaluate a on top density functional using a density and a non top pair density. And uh, the beauty of this method is that uh, it really computes the unpartitioned electronic correlation energy in a single step. Uh, it uses the the kinetic energy from the multi-configurational wave function, and then the, the density, uh, the on-top density, uh, and this on-top density uh, functional. And I want to show you, um, I mean, the, 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 how, how one does it. So we start from this multi-configurational wave function, which could be gas, RAS, uh, CAS, uh, LAS, 
And then the energy is calculated with this uh, energy expression in which basically we can say these are the, the classical energy terms. So this is the classical Coulomb. And then there is this non-classical functional that depends on rho and, uh, and pi, where rho is the total energy and pi is this on top uh, uh, density, total density on top density. And uh, um, the question is, where do we get the functional? So how do we get this non-classical functional? So uh, what we have been doing so far is to translate Konshan density functionals. So, so um, I mean, this relation holds for a single determinant. So if uh, M is the spin density, there is a relation between the spin density, the total density, and the on top uh, pair density uh, expressed by this uh, uh, capital R. And then uh, one can uh, feed into conventional functional form, rho, uh, m, uh, and uh, eventually their uh, derivatives. And so this is the expression of our non-classical functional because uh, uh, we cannot just, I mean, they, we have to impose some constraints in how we, we, we choose the dependence on M because uh, now we are dealing with the uh, non-single determinant wave function. And so eventually this R term here is, uh, is greater than one. So this, uh, these are the, the translations that we impose. So here, this is a, a, a study from some a few years ago that shows how MCPDFT works. Um, this is a typical set of uh, electronic excitation energies. And this is the average mean unsigned error. And here there are two consham functionals. Of course, I'm sure that in the consham world there would be functionals that would give uh, better results than these. But uh, if we just look at a really simple functional form like uh, PBE, this is how the, the, the translation works, uh, just starting from a cas SDF wave function. And what is beautiful here is that this method gives result uh, of similar quality to cas 2 but at a cost that uh, depends only on the parent wave function. And so much cheaper than going to higher order density matrices. So over the course of the years, and here is where the, the two RDM part comes into play, I mean, uh, we and others, uh, for example, also uh, Eugene, who is going to talk uh, um, um, after us, have been uh, uh, using different starting point for this uh, pair density functional calculation. So we have used uh, CAS, GAS, RAS. We have also shown that LAS uh, can be done, or RAS-CI, RAS-PIN-FLIP, DMRG, PDFT. So these are all possibilities. But now in the world of reduced density matrix, uh, Eugene and collaborators have performed two RDM cas stf PDFT uh, calculations. And I'm sure this is perhaps what Eugene is going to talk after. So what we've been done, and this is really, um, it's one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be at Chicago to enjoy the collaboration with David. David uh, has been working on um, obtaining these two RDMs from a quantum computer. And so what we have done in collaboration is uh, uh, compute uh, uh, PDFT energies uh, starting from this uh, um, quantum generated two uh, RDMs and compare them with classical ones. So this is uh, my last slide and then I will finish. And these are, I mean, it's a project that um, um, it's still, I mean, we have just finished this, so these are quite preliminary results. So here, um, what we have done is the following. So we, uh, this is work performed partially by uh, David's uh, students, uh, John Nicholas and Scott and Alex in my group, but um, I mean, um, compute here, I'm showing relative energies of the meta and para benzenes so with respect to the ortho benzenes obtained with uh, basically different uh, two RDMs, either from the classical computer or the quantum computer, and then treated, uh, used as a seed for subsequent calculations. Uh, David uh, group has performed ACSC calculations. We have used them for MCPDFT uh, calculations. And here, for example, you see with a, with a classical, uh, with a two and two active space, the relative energies with the classical R to RDM and with one qubit. And with a four and four, we see the classical result and 
and the one with three qubit and four qubit. And so, and here on the left, we have the ACFC results and on the right, the MCPDFT results. And so the idea is to compare classical versus uh, uh, quantum with the, with the qubit calculations. And here there are the deviations of the relative energies from the corresponding ex experimental values for the meta and para. So basically what we can see is that if we stop to through three qubits, uh, I mean, the results of the classical and quantum are, are not so different and the, the errors are within the experimental errors of these relative energies. So this is uh, with four qubit uh, and CPDFT seems to, to give results that uh, disagree more substantially with the uh, um, classical ones. So to, and here uh, we're just looking at the CAS-SCF relative energies and I focus on the, um, on the, um, pair density functional results. Um, these are two different uh, uh, translated functionals. So, so the, the point here is again, uh, classical quantum are reasonably similar uh, at the CAS-SCF level. And uh, also with these translated functionals, uh, maybe when, again, when we go to four qubits, uh, things get a little uh, different, but, uh, all within what one would expect. And it doesn't seem that there is a significant functional dependent uh, in this method. So to summarize and conclude, uh, MCDFT is a, a theory in which the, only the classical Coulomb and the kinetic energy are directly computed from the multi-configurational wave function. The rest of the energy is computed from the on top density functional in terms of rho and pi. It describes a multi-configurational uh, system with no ambiguities about which state is being approximated. So we have a, a spin eigenfunction. And uh, it scales as the, 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 the parent calculation, so CAS, GAS, or 2RDM, if one starts from that. But it produces results that are um, of quality of what one usually does with a PT2 uh, part. And, the future directions is to think more about functional development, uh, uh, also using a data-driven uh, approach and uh, use uh, um, this uh, method within a hybrid quantum classical uh, algorithm. With that, I'd like to uh, thank, so in my group today, I talked mainly about the work of Matt Hermes, uh, Riedisch van der Haar, this is about the last SCF, and the 2RDM PDFT, uh, Alex, and uh, uh, then for the um, last uh, unitary couple cluster work, this is the collaboration with Matt Otten, Stephen Gray, and Yuri Alex. And for the um, 2RDM PDFT, quantum 2RDM, uh, this, uh, uh, as I said, is a collaboration with David and uh, Scott and uh, Jan Niklas. And uh, I'd like to thank DOE for the funding and all of you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, uh, Laura, thank you for that lovely introductory talk there. I think you touched on all of the different concepts that Christian had mentioned in the introduction. So it's really a great start to the conference and to get the discussion started and so on. So we actually have time for questions. Um, so let's first of all, though, go ahead and actually invite everyone to unmute yourselves. And let's make a little bit of noise here. A little bit of applause would be nice in the virtual space. So please, I invite everyone to unmute yourselves and, and a little bit of applause. OK. Hey. All right, cool. All right, so we have time for questions. So the protocol for questions is please go ahead and either add a question in the chat room or raise your hand to ask the question directly. So I think we actually do have a question in the chat. Let's see. Um, yes, so uh, there was this uh, question by uh, Bruno. Um, QP necessitates ancilla qubits and projects so the register and projects the register state to a given eigenstate after read out of the ancilla qubit. Um, so, I mean, it's and then there is this uh, comment by uh, SI, uh, SI Jing that says, yeah, we 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 do QP. So it's a combination. This uh, approach is a combination of QP and uh, uh, VQE. So we we need QP to generate the last state on the quantum circuit. So, 
There's also a question I think about uh, the quantum phase estimation. Uh, it came up earlier. I don't see it now on there, but I guess I'll just see if I can ask the question. So it's a question about whether one could use the VQE with the last SCF directly rather than using um, a rather than using uh, quantum phase estimation. And I guess the the motivation for the question is just that a lot of the near intermediate scale quantum computers have trouble with the the, the uh, phase estimation approach. And so I was just wondering, I guess, um, you know, the question I think is, is could it also be adapted for a traditional like VQE? I, I would think so though. Yes, so actually we do the, the traditional, so to generate the last, we do traditional VQE. Uh, the, the, the QP is uh, to include this um, inter-fragment excitations. So, so they, you need both, you need the VQE if you want to do it on the quantum computer, we need to do the last uh, SCF wave function. And then to go beyond last, you do QP. Okay. Cool. Maybe that is just- Gabri, go ahead. One, yeah, just one comment. I mean, if you go to quantum phase estimation, I mean, it's like doing CI. The main problem is the number of, you, I mean, number of gears needed to do the calculation cannot be done on NISC machines. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, you need a large number of uh, gates, which is within the decoherence time, which is not there yet. So this is why VQE is the approximation for the quantum phase estimation. I mean, quantum phase estimation is doing CI. Right, right. Yeah. So right now it's just, it's too much essentially to, yeah. to be able yeah. to. Yeah, it is. And um, we, we, I mean, the largest system that we did was with uh, eight qubits, so. So I have a question actually just on, on, on the active space and the last appro approximation. So when you're localizing things, is there sometimes a sense that maybe it's over localizing for a given problem or does it seem to adapt itself to, to localize only to the amount that it needs to, to get the proper correlation in the system? No, it does not. I, I, we, so we usually start, one has to start with some localization scheme and uh, we can use uh, the metal of Dean, the boys. Uh, but uh, of course, so the, there is a degree of arbitrariness in, in doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, um, so, so, so it's another aspect that is not black box. Uh, one has to have an idea of what, how this localization should be done from the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other uh, questions from the audience? Is there uh, so there is a question. Uh, yes, Frank Jensen. If uh, last SCF looks very similar to Ormas, so Ormas is more similar to gas. In the sense that uh, so gas and ormas are um, are more uh, advanced wave function than last because uh, uh, both uh, ormas and gas uh, your ci vector spans the entire uh, set of orbitals so the entire systems here on the other hand you have ci vectors that are just within the fragment so you can think about uh, uh, last as a more primitive or more simplified way function than um, than ormas or gas all right well let's thank laura for a beautiful talk to start our symposium thank you so all much right. all right so our second speaker for this session is eugene